Thank you very much for making a day today on the market. Please welcome back. Ghana's land bill is expected to be passed soon to harmonize laws related to land issues, including land use regulation and enhancing effective management of lands in the country. The bill, which was first introduced in Parliament in 2018, was later withdrawn but tabled again before Parliament this year. According to the Technical Director for Lands at the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources, Ebenezer Kobina Datsun, they are hopeful the bill will be passed before the end of this year. The law, among other things, seeks to consolidate and harmonize in one simplified form about 166 existing laws related to land to regulate land use and enhance effective land management in the country. According to the Technical Director for Lands at the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resource, they are hopeful the bill will be passed before the end of tenure of the current parliament. We are consolidating all the, the, the laws regarding land in the country. Some are obsolete, they will be discarded, and then there are new ones given technology worldwide. We need to make our laws um, relevant um, globally, and so that's what we are doing. We are bringing in customary laws as well, and also looking at the, the land sector agencies, their roles, um, and etc. So it is, it is a comprehensive law that will deal with all our land issues from one document. The bill right now has gone beyond the Lands Commission and the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources. It's at the floor of Parliament for the second reading, so it is a matter for Parliament to deal with. We are very optimistic that um, by, the, by the end of the tenure of this Parliament, we should have a land act in place. He also adds other bills such as the Real Estate Bill, as well as the Survey and Council Bill, are also before Parliament. There's actually also the um, um, Survey a council bill, which is also being worked on now. So all of them are at various stages. And you know, when it's in parliament, they have their own schedules. And so we, we cannot determine the completion date. But what we're doing is that we're doing all that needs to be done so that these things will see the light of day um, to serve the people of Ghana. For Joy Business, Sheila Tamaklu reporting. Now, a spokesperson for the receiver of defunct microfinance, uh, say, microfinance companies and savings and loans companies, Philomena Kuzo, has been justifying the recent low sales experience at the first auctioning process for vehicles belonging to the defunct firms. According to her, the process has been successful looking at the number of vehicles sold so far. However, she notes the receiver will be calling back the evaluators to review prices of the remaining vehicles that couldn't be sold at the end of the exercise. She spoke with Joy Business at the end of the first process here in Accra. We came in with 169 vehicles. As at yesterday, we've done 115 vehicles. So, what are the status of these vehicles? Why do you think, um, is it that the prices are too high or why are people not? Still... You know, I believe that people came with their own preconceived prices. So they thought it was going to be that low, lower than even the market price, I'm very sure. But when they came and they realized it was, I mean, that is, it was valued and that is the uh, um, prices that the valuer came up with. And some of them were a bit disappointed. I could hear people saying that uh, when we started initially and they said give an offer, somebody mentioned as low as a thousand Ghana for a Toyota car, which is, I mean, not to, if that was the expectation, then that was bad, then it was really dash because th there was no way we could sell a vehicle for a thousand cities. But could you also be, could, could you also be that maybe the valuers didn't do a good job? I think they did a good job. I think they did a good job. If we have sold these number of cars, we've sold about 115 and then we are still selling. I think they did a good job. For, honestly, for those that maybe they think were on the high, we will go back to the values and they will revalue it. You're watching the marketplace live on Joy News. Let's turn attention to some developments within the oil and gas sector. A report from Bloomberg indicates Talo Oil plans to cut a third of its staff to slash administrative costs by a fifth 
or around $20 million. Sources say the situation is due to weak output in Ghana, delays in East Africa, and lower than hoped for oil quality in Guyana. Philip Namfuri joins me to take a look at what the report actually says. Plus, later on, we link up with uh, via Skype with energy expert Ishbel Ejikunye to make some to do some analysis on this particular issue. You're welcome to the market. Yeah, thank you, Emmanuel. So, what is the report telling us now? So, the first one I want to draw our attention to is a story I saw in Bloomberg yesterday. That one referred to um, Talo in Kenya, and it says Talo PLC will reduce its headcount in Kenya by about forty percent as part of a company-wide restructuring following poor performances at its Africa and Guyana operations. About 35 workers will become redundant. Talo Kenya Managing Director Martin Mbogo said in an email response to questions, the reduced team will focus on achieving a final investment decision for the Kenya project this year, Mr. Mbogo said. So that's for Kenya. Okay. Then today, another one comes up that says, Talo Oil plans to cut a third of workforce seeking 20 million in savings. Mm. So I was going through the story and quite interesting. So Talo plans to cut a third of its staff to slash its administration costs by a fifth or around $20 million, a source with direct knowledge of the matter said. After weak output in Ghana, like we said, delays in East Africa and lower than mm. hope for oil quality in Guyana. As I'm just going through the story, I see um, the oil industry in, in, in general is a, a it's quite a tricky enterprise, mm. Uh, mm. I would say so. Very capital intensive. Exactly. Mm. And when you are prospecting for deposits and perhaps you don't get what you expect, it feeds into your operations. Oil prices on the global economy have also taken a slump, even though there has been some recovery. Now, we don't know what the impact of this coronavirus. I'm just mm. speaking in broad terms. This coronavirus, its impact on demand for oil and oil-dependent countries. Okay. So you see in there that um, we, last year there was a resignation of the head of um, Talo yeah. on account of a number of issues. Mm -hmm. But going through the story, I see the concern should be if they're cutting a third of their workforce, what about Talo Ghana? There has been no mention of Talo Ghana okay. in the you story. You think it will necessarily affect Talo well, Ghana? Well, well, well Manuel, if they are cut around their workforce, where are their operations heavily centered? Africa. Am I right? Ghana is one of the major operations. operations. So Africa. we shouldn't be shocked um, no. not to say that they are going to be cuts in Ghana. We don't have that authority to speak. But going through the story, okay. I see in there that it, it's, it's something that can happen. All right, so hold on a minute, and we want to link up with energy expert Ishmael Jokouni via Skype to do some more analysis. Ishmael, you're welcome to the marketplace. Oops. All right, so I believe you are privy to this latest report uh, by Talo. And what do you make of this report, especially when two key personnel uh, from Talo you know, resigned last uh, couple of months ago because of poor performance in Ghana at the Jubilee Field? So oil, these oil companies are always driven by profits. And their fields even before they decide to produce, it has to be very profitable, otherwise it will go in to do it. Their revenues are driven by two main, two main factors, price and also production costs. Um, it's clear that because the prices are, are not being well and production volumes are dipping, their revenues are affected. And once revenues are affected then you need to cut costs. So obviously this is one surprise and this is very from the oil industry. When fields are profitable or the applications are not being met, the likelihood is that do you think it's bad times for Talo Oil Ghana? I mean necessarily because of this particular report that we are receiving. Um, well I would put it as hard time but it's clear that if a third of the staff, of Talo staff are going to be downsized or retrenched, uh, it's quite a sizable could be because Ghana is their cash cap. Look at their operation. In fact, in 2019, close to about 70% of their production, total production, in Ghana. 
So it presupposes that if the Ghana operation is not big in the in the in the context of the portfolio, then I am not being a problem, but it, it sounds like it might affect what uh, in Ghana as well. Well, so like you put it, Ghana is the cash cow for tallow in Africa. Now, we've hyped the Jubilee field, we've hyped uh, 10 oil fields uh, for quite a long time. Now, what could be the reason behind the sudden, you know, slowdown in the prospects of the fields? For Jubilee, we've always known the FDSO coming is a very, very problematic. Uh, year in, year out, they are revising their projection because yeah, it's taking much longer than they expected. The the FPS uh, for the ten projects, do we are aware that there are gas issues? You know, uh, you need to get rid of gas before you produce oil, and these fields are associated fields. So, a, com a combination of factors. But Jubilee, we've known in the FPS so in the main. Okay. And for the 10, I think it's the gas evaporation of gas and the fact that we have excess of that. I think if the markets were to do it, they'll be forced to rather flare quite a, quite a substantive amount of gas. The market is not going to well. Demands are deep, and then the coronavirus is not just taking a hit. So I think in Ghana is quite obvious, and the problem has been, been lingering for some time now. So, so lastly, before you go, do you think that you know, with other players in Ghana's waters, do you think that there will be a time when Talo will relinquish its takes to other, you know, bigger, bigger players like ExxonMobil? Uh, well, they've, they've said that it's an option on the table. Selling the asset, it's an option on the table. I think it depends on how they see the long term long-term future of, of the field. But there's no doubt that you can intend and these fields are profitable. I think it's a, only a matter of these problems on the But the industry is you can't keep staff if they're not making money. So, I mean, we are projecting only million dollars of money if they're able to so these people, they could finish that when the business picks up, they are going to put people anyway. So it's a cycle working those things. All right, many thanks for that input. Uh, Ishmael Jagun is an energy expert. He joined us via Skype. Back to the studio. Now, so you are a researcher. Around times like these, what should workers be thinking about? What should management of, um, of Talo in Ghana be doing? Now? Um, well, um, Emmanuel, like you said, they are looking for profits. And I've always discussed here, the ultimate aim of a firm is to drive shareholder maximization, mm -hmm. the value of the shareholders' funds, what they put inside. So we need to look into that. Mm -hmm. I know sometimes it's a bit disheartening when it comes to, um, you know, letting your workers go. But then there's a video um, that we got today from the IMF, um, looking at projections of where oil demand will be in the next couple of years and how countries who depend on oil should start reorganizing their balance sheets. No, Phil, so is that, does it mean that beyond 2040, oil production will not be as you know, interesting again as it is now? Oil production will go on. Is the demand that may start waning because, you know, climate change is the front and center of the current discourse. Okay. Renewable energy sources are coming up, cleaner fuels, etc. The world is moving to a stage where we don't want the fossil fuels to have a negative impact on the climate. So we want to look for cleaner sources. Cleaner sources means staying away from the oil industry. Mm. That demand will drop. Already I've seen people moving towards electrical vehicles or electric vehicles whatsoever. So this is a fluid situation, but this is what the IMF projects for 2040. A peak in demand and it starts weighing down from there. By that time, you and I will be some old men. But, but what, does it mean for, what does it mean for Ghana? What does it mean for Ghana? It means we need to ramp up our efforts on diversification of our economy. I put something on Twitter, on my personal Twitter page. We need to ramp up our diversification. We can't continue to depend on these commodities any longer. All right, thank you very much for that input there. Philip Naufuri is our in-house researcher. He's still live on the market. Please, we take a very short break here. We'll be right back after this.
Thanks very much for staying. Welcome back. Now, according to the World Health Organization, work-related health problems result in an economic loss of 4 to 6% of GDP for most countries. It is therefore essential for companies to provide conducive working conditions for employees. However, recent research by the BBC showed about 8.6 million employees fake sicknesses to get some break off work. Karen Dubin has more in this report. Have you ever faked sickness just to get a day off work? Or maybe you connived with a medical practitioner to get an excuse duty slip? Well, did you know that this is unlawful and could lead to your prosecution? Now, despite this, a recent research reported by the BBC showed that about 9 million people in 2019 alone did so because of what they term as poor working conditions and stress. Today, we hear the shoes of a crowd to find out how many Ghanaians have done that before and what the reasons were. Most employees I engaged admitted to feigning sickness just to avoid work. However, they were unwilling to go on record over fears of being victimized by the employers. Gilbert, who however spoke to Joy Business, admitted to have done that because he was under excessive stress and needed time off to rest. I ran off out of my leave days, so I had no leave day schedule again. So I had to call in and tell my boss that yes. Um, I'm not feeling well, so I need to stay in the house and go to the hospital as early. So. But are you aware it's unlawful and if your employer should ever find out or when you were working they could have prosecuted you, are you aware? Yes, I am aware it's, it's unlawful, but actually I was stressed out. Um, the work is very, very stressful. We speak for over 7, and 30, um, seven hours, 30 minutes. So sometimes you work within four days continuously, really that you are stressed down. So sometimes... It's, it's not a wish though, but you need to call in for it to get that rest, yes. According to the research by the IT company Insight, a larger percentage of the sampled audience accused their actions on what they termed painful jobs, blamed on work culture, interaction with colleagues and workload. So what then could corporate institutions do to improve working conditions? Human resource expert Senior Jabbing explains that failure of corporate institutions to provide safe and convenient working environments could mean losses to the organizations involved. You see, employees sometimes leave workplaces because they have bad supervisors. It's very common for supervisors, or let me put it this way, supervision in Ghana often is seen as shouting at people and making people's lives difficult. When that happens, it creates a, 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 um, a hostile environment for the worker. And if the worker is demotivated and fears the workplace and is not willing to be part of the workplace, does not have a sense of belonging in the workplace, then you would have um, workers who are demotivated and would often look for reasons not to go to work. He also stressed the importance of annual vacations, explaining that it's a must that HRs ensure the employees go on leave as part of their human rights. So before you make that call tomorrow morning to fake the stomach pain, perhaps you could just request for a normal leave break, which is your mandate as a worker. Interesting reports there. Now, three former diplomats from Africa have been shortlisted for a final pick to head the Secretariat of the Continental Free Trade Agreement in Accra. The exercise, which is expected to end this weekend, February 9, has no Ghanaian in the finalists, despite the country hosting the Secretariat for the most ambitious trade. My colleague Ebenezer has some updates. He joined me in the studio. Ebenezer, what's Hi. up? Cool. So uh, it's interesting, you mm. know, uh, Ghana is hosting the uh, Secretariat for the Continental Free Trade Agreement. Yeah. Let me begin from the start. They shortlisted, I mean, 121 people applied for the mm -hmm. job. Initially, we had two Ghanaians, but through the screening process, they when off. they got to the third year, they fell off. So we, they moved to 30. And then when going to the next stage, which they had six people, we couldn't get our Ghanaians mm. in it. And then so who are these three people? So we, we have, the, I mean, one from Nigeria, okay. Cecilia. Her name is Cecilia Akinto Dili. And then we also have one from the uh, South Africa, who is Wankele Mele. And then also one from the Rep Dem Democratic Republic of Congo, Faustine Longa. All these three have served in various capacities at both the World Trade Organization and then also the African Development Bank. Mm. So there's the need for these people to bring together their experiences to help the continent grow uh, in trade and then also in I mean, advancing activities and all that. Okay. Yeah. So when is the you know, successful person going to be announced? So the, uh, the heads of state are, will be having a meeting in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia this weekend. Okay. And then on Sunday, the Commissioner, African Industry and Trade Minister, 
will announce the successful winner for this year. All right, thank you very much. Let's wait to have time. And here we end the marketplace for today. Many thanks for your company. My name is Imano Abuaji. We are being a good afternoon.